Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. Are you struggling with like weird bass problems in your oddly shaped room? Maybe you've got a room with like angled walls or like a sloped ceiling. It's definitely some unusual shape. And now you're thinking that you're doomed, doomed to poor sound. Well, that's not the case. Most rooms definitely have problems, but fixing those low end issues is actually easier than you think. There is a proven process that you can follow to get a reliable low end, even in your oddly shaped room. And that's what I want to talk about in this video. I want to give you four simple steps that you can follow to fix your low end problems even in the weirdest room setups. And if you want to follow along these steps in more detail, make sure you check out my home studio treatment framework that you can download for free at the link in the description. These are my five steps to systematically treating a room and getting it to translate. So what I'm going to talk about in this video is an excerpt from this framework. And it's basically a top level process to take your room from empty to fully treated. It's all in there, all the steps that you need to take nicely sorted for you so you can follow them step by step. And most importantly, that, that you do the right thing. You focus on the right thing at the right time because it's so easy to basically back yourself into a corner by forgetting something essential that you should do right at the start. And in that case, the best thing you can often do is just rip everything apart and start again from scratch. I don't want you to be that person. I don't want you to have to turn in circles while treating your studio. So make sure you check out the home studio treatment framework follow those steps and you're basically guaranteed to get the most out of your room and speakers, a sound that translates perfectly well to the outside world. So you can stop thinking about sound, stop thinking about acoustics and actually get back to just focusing on making music. That's why we're doing this all in the first place. But with that, let's get back to actually talking about how to fix the low end in your oddly shaped room. And the first thing, that I want to focus on is that you understand how exactly that odd shape actually messes up the low end. Because in a standard rectangular room, it's pretty simple. You get standing waves building up between parallel surfaces, between the left and right, front to back, floor and ceiling. You get harmonics of those standing waves, and those all together basically form the low end response of your room. But when your room isn't a rectangle, this whole pattern actually gets very unpredictable. So to show you that, let's jump into AMROC, the room mode calculator. You've seen me use this before. If you're new to this, if you haven't seen it, check it out in the description. It's basically a, a calculator that, based on the dimensions of your room, gives you the room modes, the standing waves that you can expect. And so here I've modeled a simple rectangular room 540 by 420 by 320 centimeters. And we've got a bunch of room modes that potentially form. So this one's left to right. The first one here was front to back, again, left to right. Here we've got our first non-axial mode, then the mode between floor to ceiling, and so on. It's pretty predictable. If you want to understand the pattern, the standing wave pattern in a rectangular room, we can use these simple models to figure that out. But here's what happens when that room isn't a perfect rectangle. So I've used the same dimensions, but I've added this little awkward angle here on one side of the room, right? So here's what that looks like if I kind of pan around. And now let's see what happens to those standing waves. So here's our first one, front to back, half a wavelength. It's somewhat regular, but we can already see that the pattern between a pressure buildup and a pressure null isn't symmetrical in the room. Here is the next one. So this is left to right. Again, we see the same thing happening. Floor to ceiling, actually not so much happens there because in a floor to ceiling perspective, the room isn't actually symmetrical. But now let's move on to the first full wavelength that fits between the front and back of the room. And now you can see just how odd the standing wave pattern is that forms. And here is the next one up. And technically this would be left to right, 
or would this be front to back? It's hard to tell. And that's kind of where our issues come from, right? The standing waves start becoming so unpredictable that you can't really make an educated guess about what actually happens in the low end. Yeah, so that's point number one to take away. It's really hard to predict the standing wave pattern, the room modes in an oddly shaped room. And that brings me to point number two, that is to fix the low end, you really have to nail down your listener and speaker placement. And in particular, the listener placement, the listening position. That's really the biggest lever that we have to get a balanced low end. And the idea is pretty simple. The key is to find the room's low end sweet spot. So a, a point in the room where the balance between all the energy in all these standing waves roughly balances out. And on top of that actually has left right symmetry because obviously once we set up our stereo speakers we want to get the same response from both just mirrored and the way to do that is to set up symmetrically from a left right perspective again looking at amrock in a standard rectangular room this would be pretty simple we basically just set up in the middle perfectly centered along the length axis of this room and then we'd basically find the spot the right distance from the front wall where the, um, the, the balance is as equal as possible between these room modes. That's your typical 38% rule as it applies to rectangular rooms, right? We're basically trying to sit at about 38% of the length of the room because that's where you're going to get the right balance in terms of low end energy from the front to back axial modes in the room. But if we go to our asymmetrical, our odd room, obviously this isn't as straightforward anymore. We still want to find that low end sweet spot in the room, that spot where those the energy balances out across all the room modes, but it's not going to follow that same rule of thumb guideline. So we need to actually test the room and find that spot for the individual room that we're in. And like I said, on top of that, we want local symmetry. Right, So in a room like this one here, we'd have local symmetry. If we set up on the left side of this room, if we kind of split the room in two between these two walls, that would be one axis on which we could position our listing position. Or on the other side, we want local symmetry again as well. So here again, we could split the room in two and have an axis on which we could place our listening position. And then the exercise simply becomes to find the spot on these particular axes where our room modes balance out. So how do you do this in practice? Well, you could obviously look at models like this, right? And if I zoom in, you can kind of get an idea of where that, that spot might be. You don't want to be in a high pressure zone. You don't want to be in a null either. It's going to be somewhere around here on that side. And then on the other side, potentially here somewhere for this particular room mode. But obviously, if we're trying to do the same for this room mode, which we are, it might not be that obvious, right? And so these models are interesting to get an idea of where you might want to set up. But to really nail down and fine tune that position, you need to be more precise. And you could do this with measurements. That would be kind of the next most obvious thing. But the problem with measurements is that they tend to end up being very, very confusing. It's very hard to deduce from the graphs on your screen what that actually sounds like in practice. And so what I recommend you actually do is to do a simple structured listening test. I call this the base hunter technique. And if you check out my home studio treatment framework, and as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a guide in there that will walk you through that process of simply using one speaker and some music and your ears to figure out where the bass is the most balanced along these axes that you've pre-selected because of local left and right symmetry in your room. So once you've done that, you can move on to step number three. And now we're talking about actual acoustic treatment, right? So bass traps in particular, obviously for low end treatment. In odd shaped rooms, it's particularly interesting to use your typical modular porous absorption bass traps. So these are deep absorbers. 
typically 16 centimeters, six inches or more in material depth. And the reason why these are so beneficial, especially in odd-shaped rooms, is because they aren't tuned devices. They will absorb any energy that hits them. And if the depth of the panel, including a potential air gap, is deep enough, you will be able to absorb the sound. And that's why this is kind of the go-to solution for controlling a larger frequency range, because they aren't fine-tuned devices, they absorb broadband. And the great thing here is that you don't have to try and make things perfect. Bass traps even work wonders in imperfect rooms. The more you do here, the more the ringing of these standing waves that we looked at will be damped and the closer you will actually get to a flat frequency response in the low end. If you want to see this in action, check out the video that I did with my buddy Shane who used these exact techniques to treat the bass in his tiny, tiny attic studio and just see just how well this actually works if you put in the effort, if you put in the time, if you're willing to do what it takes. But the reality is, and that brings me to kind of point or step four, if you will, that even with all this work that you put in, it's still very hard in your typical home studio, your small rooms to actually get a low frequency balance that is good enough to make educated decisions. You can get very close, you can kind of get to good, but taking it to great usually requires some touching up with speaker equalization, so room correction. And especially in oddly shaped rooms, the benefits are twofold. First of all, like I just mentioned, touching up the bass response. And then on top of that, if there are any asymmetries left in the responses from your individual speakers, because the room is asymmetrical around you, even if you've got that local symmetry, the speaker equalization software can actually compensate that and basically get the responses and match the responses of your speakers as best as possible both in terms of timing and in terms of frequency. But you still want to do this as the last step in the chain. I think that's where a lot of people are too reliant on just slapping on and seeing what the software does. The problem obviously being that equalization cannot actually fix the time aspect, right? The reverb, very generally said, in the room and obviously the ringing of standing waves, it can only adjust the frequency response. And the harder it has to work, usually kind of the weirder it sounds. So you want it to do less just purely on how it sounds. But then also it always adds latency to your system, which you might not want. And then for me, what I find is the strongest argument for using speaker equalization sparingly is that it robs your speakers of headroom. In other words, your speakers will just start distorting at a lower volume if you push a lot of energy into them with an equalizer. So that's why you want to do this as the last step in the chain. And if you've done everything correctly up to this point, you might actually find that either it has to do very little, or in many cases, you might find that you don't actually need it at all. Yeah, There is some benefit to using it from purely a kind of measurement perspective, but when it actually comes to working, and to getting your music and your mixes to translate, you might actually find that you don't need it at all. So if you're dealing with low-end problems in an oddly shaped room, those are the four steps that allow you to actually address and fix those issues. First of all, just understanding how unpredictable the low-end can be in an oddly shaped room and that the biggest lever to fixing that is actually nailing down your listening position, finding your low-end sweet spot and setting up your listening position in that spot. On top of that, porous absorption bass traps are your biggest friend because they work broadband and they will suck up low-end energy to some extent, no matter where you put them. And then fourth, speaker equalization. If you find that you cannot do enough through these three steps, to actually get to a point where your low end is balanced enough to translate properly, touching up your response with EQ is a perfectly viable way to actually take you that last mile and get your system to translate properly. So I hope that makes sense. 
it is a proven process. It works. It, there's no voodoo here. There's no magic here. It just takes going through those steps in the right order and making sure you get as much out of them as possible. And that will allow you to get a usable low end that translates even in an Audi shape room. All right, with that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.